Mark here. Kavich here. Wiesikowski here. Donnie here. Supert here. Chandler here. Uh, we have the approvals of the minutes of April 23rd and May 14th. We're going to take these separately because uh, some members were here, some weren't. So we get a motion on the 23rd if any, correct, any corrections, errors, before we make motion. Seifert moves to approve the minutes of April 23rd, 2019. Chandler seconds. Roll call. Anna aye. Sullivan aye. Perlo aye. Clark abstains. David abstains. Zikowski aye. Aldani abstains. Seifert aye. Chandler aye. And now if you'd look over the minutes of May 14th, 2019. And when you're ready, motion, please. Seifert moves to approve the minutes of May 14th, 2019. Anna seconds. Roll call. Anna aye. Sullivan aye. Roll abstains. Clark aye. Kavich abstains. Wiskowski aye. Aldani aye. Seifert aye. Chandler abstains. Okay. Uh, significant common council actions carry. Council approved the following, an ordinance for approving a rezoning of the properties at 7705, 7725, 7751, 7781, 7811, 7831, and 7869 South 13th Street to B4 Highway Business Plan Unit Development, and an ordinance approving a rezoning of the property at 7581 South 13th Street from RM1 Multifamily Residential to RM1 Multifamily Residential Plan Unit Development. No change to the FW Floodway, FF Flood Fringe, or C1 Shoreland Wetland Conservancy Districts. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, item 5A is a public hearing. The applicant has withdrawn his, his uh, request to amend the comprehensive plan, so we will not have that public hearing tonight. Um, we did have a uh, resident wishing to speak. Arden, would you still like to speak on that, or you want to hold your powder until it actually comes forward? Okay. Um, that will get us to new business in 6A. And again, there will be no action there, but we do need a motion. No, no action, no motion. So there'll be no action on 6, 6A. Uh, gets us to 5B, and that's a sign appeal for Kevin Schroeder Jewelers. Um, looking for a new sign on a tenant space. So... And you are ready, Carrie? I'll read the notice of public hearing into the record. Cityville Creek, notice of public hearing before the plan commission. A public hearing for a sign appeal, appeal will be held Tuesday, May 28, 2019 at 6 p.m. at the Oak Creek City Hall Common Council Chambers, 8040 South 6th Street, Oak Creek, Wisconsin, 53154. The appellant is Kelvin Schrader Jewelers, tax key and property location as listed. The request is for a variance from section 170706 sub J sub 2, which states that the area of a wall sign within a planned sign program shall equal one square foot of signage per lineal frontage of tenant space with a maximum of 100 square feet. If, the grant, if granted, the variance would allow the applicant to install one wall sign that is 115.77 square feet in area for one tenant that occupies both tenant spaces B and C, as identified on the master sign plan for the development located at 8645 South Howell Avenue. Zoning of the property is B4 Highway Business. All interested persons wishing to be heard are invited to be present. Dated this 8th day of May 2019, Plan Commission, City of Oak Creek, Mayor Dan J. Bukavich, Chairman. This is a public hearing. All those wishing to express opinions on this matter shall approach the podium, state their name and address, and address their comments to the plan commission. This public hearing is now open. Thank you, Carrie. As, as Carrie stated, we will make three calls. This will be the first call. Anybody wishing to speak? Mr. Mayor, perhaps I can provide a little bit of information oh. before we have any Please. comments. The proposal is to allow one wall sign that is about 115.78 or 77 square feet in area for one tenant. Uh, you'll notice that the Tenant space is the same, however, there is an addition of a diamond graphic that is atop the Kelvin Schrader, Joder, Schul, sorry, Kelvin Schrader Jewelers 
uh, channel center panel letter sign that was approved um, by the Plan Commission in October. Just the channel letters were 60 fair, square feet and the Plan Commission uh, approved that variance request as the tenant was going to be occupying two tenant spaces actually. So that request um, was limited in, to an occupant for both tenant spaces. In other words, that would be limited uh, for that specific size sign only in the event that both tenant spaces would be occupied by a single tenant. So the, the new request is for the 115 and a little bit more than that square foot sign to incorporate the two foot eight inch by four foot three inch diamond. Uh, the plan commission in consideration of this appeal may consider location, size, number, anything other than content. The decision to approve must be based on the four criteria that was stated in the staff report. Staff does not make recommendations on sign appeals. However, if the Plan Commission wishes to approve of the proposed appeal, uh, there is a suggested motion within the report itself. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Carrie. As Carrie said, this is a public hearing. Uh, I did make the first call. I will move on to the second call. Third and final call. We'll now close the public hearing and move on to item 6B. Um, I will now open it up to the commission for any questions, comments. Christina? Matt? Dawn, anything? No, it's very attractive, and uh, it, it is on a, a main um, street that, that gets a lot of attraction. Craig, anything? I have no issues with it. The lettering itself fits more with the neighboring stores size-wise. No yeah. issues with it. Chris? Uh, I agree. I think it looks good. Huh? I have no comments. It's fine. Fred? It looks good. Similar to the sign they already have on their old building. Crossing? I do have a question for I'm Kelvin Matthew Schrader, business owner. And oh, 8645 South Howell Avenue, Hill Creek. And just for clarity, so was the sign always this large? It's just the dimensions were not the, including the, the diamond. Well, I think it was the 60 square feet that was given originally was inclu did include our logo, and then once we had it prototype made by our sign company, the letters were just so tiny they were like 10 inches it up on the bump out it just it didn't match our neighboring sign um, and we didn't really want to lose our diamond because it's part of a logo and as, as this gentleman said it is actually on our pylon sign already so okay so it's basically we're a adding much the, larger sign so that you can see it from well the the lettering still is the 60 but we added that uh, the 11 square feet i guess it is for to add our diamond logo so we can still retain that that's what we wanted okay okay thank you Okay. Um, no other comments? I guess I'll add my two cents in. Um, I do think it improves the building somewhat. Uh, building still just doesn't flow really well, size-wise. Um, it's not really the primary agenda, but um, I mean, it's a little over, but I think the diamond's essential to show off you know, just the product and their brand. So I, I'm okay with it. Uh, I do think the building's going in the right direction. Needed a facelift, so thank you for doing that. Not done um, yet. A lot more to go. <laughs> no, no. It's just, just kind of a throw-off with the different awnings and things like that. Well, the Papa John, we kind of wanted to retain the red. The pink. Yeah, I understand. There's there's, you know, there's brands to maintain just like you're doing. So um, I guess I'm okay. So nothing else. Uh, motion. Seifert moves to approve the sign request by Kevin Schrader Jewelry. Oracle second. Roll call. Uh, wait, 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 nope. wait, wait a second, please. There is a suggested motion on page two of three at the bottom. If you would please uh, state that motion. I will restate my motion. 
Paper moves that the Planning Commission approves a signed variance allowing the installation of one 115.77 square foot wall sign for one tenant that occupies both tenant spaces B and C as identified on the master sign <coughs> plan for the multi commercial building at 8645 South Howell Avenue. Clark will second. Roll call. And an aye. Sullivan, aye. Bill, aye. Clark, aye. Kavich, aye. Isikowski, aye. Aldani, aye. Seaford, aye. Chandler, aye. <coughs> Thank you for restating the motion. I appreciate it. I'm sorry. I wasn't paying attention. It happens. Item Thank 6C you. is an official map amendment uh, for the properties at 819, 189R, and 901. proposal is to amend officially mapped streets affecting the properties at 819, 819R, and 901 East Drexel Avenue as shown in red on the screen. Highlighted right now is the, um, the overall area that would be affected by the amendment to the official map should the amendment be approved or recommended for approval. And in the, on the screen right now would be the amendment. However, we have received um, an update to the proposal, and that is not included in your reports. This is new information that was received at the end of last week. The origin of this is a concept plan that was to prepare the site for potential sale and development. However, there was a lack of direct access from the official map that would have restricted the development potential of these properties. So there's a proposed new public road off of East Drexel Avenue that's reflected in the map on the screen right now. This would also be served by multiple future access points. Additional properties for each scenario involved would also be affected. There have been ongoing discussions regarding phasing of a future subdivision, which is shown on this plan as well. Additional information regarding wetlands, stormwater management, floodplain impacts, and the like would be required at a later date. This is conceptual only. When considering a proposal to amend the official map, the commission should consider the impact on the ability to logically develop adjacent pro properties in accordance with existing, the existing official map. Nearby property owners may have an interest in maintaining certain aspects of an official map if it provides them the future opportunity to subdivide their property in a cost-effective manner. If a person is proposing to remove this opportunity, opportunity or to alter it, they need to demonstrate that any adverse ad effects on the property owners involved will be offset by the benefit to the neighborhood. In other words, a property owner should not be able to amend the official map to maximize the development potential of their own property at the detriment of surrounding properties. As mentioned in your staff report, staff did have some concerns for the effects on the properties to the south specifically. Um, there was an amendment approved in 2017 for the property at 928 East Forest Hill Avenue. Now, this configuration that is on the screen was <coughs> excuse me, intended to address some of staff's comments. However, staff has not had a, an opportunity to review the proposal as it reflects uh, the existing official map, what was proposed previously, and the effect on the surrounding properties. There is a suggested motion, however, that the Plan Commission recommends to the Common Council that the official map for a portion of the northeast quarter of Section 16 be amended after a public hearing, provided, however, that the proposal is revised to eliminate conflicts with existing and planned homes on adjacent properties. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Carrie. <coughs> um, we'll start out uh, with seeing if anybody has any questions concerning the official map. Jossie, you're nodding. You do. I do. Go ahead. <laughs> is the applicant here? Can you please come up to the podium? Uh, name and address, sir. Karen Cook with Pinnacle Engineering Group, um, 15850 Blue Mound Road uh, in Brookfield. I'm the civil engineer and planner that's been uh, working with uh, the realtor and with the owner to develop a, a plan. Okay, so my question is, um, in our documentation, it shows that the reconfiguration, it impacts one of the properties. 
So can you provide a little more information on the impact and the solution for eliminating that impact? Sure. Initially, we had drawn uh, a layout that went through uh, one of the existing single family homes there. Um, whenever we do, we'll call it a, a new development that has existing homes in it like this, it's always hard to tell which of the homes are going to stay and which of them are going to get demolished or, or rebuilt. That, that, that does happen sometimes. When a developer comes in, obviously they want to maximize their yield. And so sometimes you're able to keep some homes. Sometimes it just doesn't work out in that if you keep a home, you might keep one, but you lose the opportunity to build you know, four new um, home sites. So we came up with a layout that, you know, that elected to, to remove one of those houses. Which, which house is um, It is the one, to it. I'm not sure the best way to point to it. <laughs> like the second one west of the park entrance. So subsequent that, to that, though, we received staff comments and said, hey, maybe that's not a good idea. Is there another way we can do this? So we came up with another layout. Now, that layout I don't think is quite as efficient. So it's whoever develops that is going to have to make some of these decisions as to do we, you know, do we keep the house, do we not keep the house. They may not control the house. Um, so there's, there's a lot of what ifs that go into you know, the future planning and division So, Hang on, Fred. She's still got the floor. Hang in there. So, uh, just for clarity, so what was the solution to eliminating a house? We we reconfigured the roads in a different pattern oh. to leave that house. So leave the house it's there. a little bit more similar to how the original uh, official map was. Okay. And so, what what is the process to contact the owner of those houses? Have they been contacted about potentially eliminating that house? No, we're not proposing to eliminate it this oh, time. Okay. We are simply saying here is a potential future concept plan that could be affected by a developer in the future. Much okay. like what exists today is you have an official map that says this is you know, a good possibility of how this might get developed. We've looked at it and said, we agree, but we'd like to make some changes to that because it works better um, for us to do it this way. So whoever looks at that piece in the south will probably do the same thing depending on what land they control and what houses they you know, do or don't control and how they, how they want to develop that if they want to maximize you know, the yield or if they want to keep some of the existing homes. So I guess I'm unclear. So are we approving the map that we have, which goes through the property, or are we to approve this revised map, which we just found out about? I guess I'll defer to staff a little bit. Um, but yeah, let, let Doug kind of clarify the, the concept on that. Uh, a couple of things. I, I think that certainly, well, we make every effort to uh, get the you know the most recent graphics and the most recent exhibits to the, the commission. Uh, Obviously, in this case, that just didn't happen. So I, I, I don't expect that you would be in a position, unless you felt comfortable with it, to, uh, re to recommend to the council approval of this exhibit. I think before we even get to that point, though, I think that there's some further explanation that's warranted with respect to the area that's shown in yellow that Carrie's highlighted here. Uh, while the, the latest exhibit does uh, remove that officially mapped street from the existing home, You'll remember that the uh, official map amendment that was done in 2017 by that property owner essentially took off that cross street so that they could build a house in that location. So, I mean, that, I guess that's that's our concern is that, it, you know, it's basically undoing what was done in 2017 uh, at the, I don't want to say at the expense of this the property owner, but certainly that it would have impacts on this property owner and, and something that was, essentially that roadway was taken off a year and a half ago. So I, I guess personally, professionally, 
I mean, I would not be uh, in, in favor of uh, the latest exhibit, which shows the alignment to the south. I think that still needs some work. And to the extent that, you know, if that, if the commission concurs with that, I think there's still some work to be done with there. One thing I would note as well, I think this warrants a, a little bit further discussion. And there's, you'll notice that, I mean, what was done on the, the properties involved themselves, I think, is fine. There's going to, still going to be a lot of discussion when it comes to the subdivision and platting stage with respect to the the, the final engineering of, of any potential subdivision there. But probably the, the biggest or mo no, no, most noteworthy change to the official map is the roadway to the to Avonshine Park. You'll see on the east side of this development, this cut property, shows an officially mapped street, which essentially goes all the way down from Drexel Avenue to Forest Hill, uh, along and entirely within the Avonshine Park. Uh, this, as it's configured right now, there is no direct access to this property. So, in essence, for this property to develop, they would have be they would essentially be at the mercy of the city, who would have to put in that roadway, or their property, their neighboring property to the west, who likewise would have to put in what is, amounts to a pretty extensive amount of roadway for the lot yield that they could get out of it. In any case, the likelihood of the official map, uh, the, the neighborhood developing in accordance with the official map without substantial cooperation, substantial investment from the city and adjacent property owners is pr pretty unlikely. Uh, certainly could happen, but I think there's a lot that would need to happen. Uh, so I think that this warrants a, a discussion from the commission, certainly as to the A, the likelihood, and B, the desirability of maintaining a public roadway connection through Avonshine Park from that runs from Drexel Avenue to Forest Hill. I'd, I'd like this commission to have some discussion centered around that topic. I mean, what happens on the subject properties themselves, uh, I think works. Uh, we're just not sure we don't have the, the clarity that we need that the impacts to the property of the south are, are such that uh, we're able to recommend approval at this point in time. Thanks, Doug. Dawson, you finished? Brad? <clears throat> You've answered my question, Doug, about the road that's for the park going in, and was there some cooperation with the developer and the city to improve that road and extend it, or are we kind of just sitting back and waiting to see what happens? Well, I'm, I'm going to draw upon Matt here in a second just to give some a little bit of background and maybe just talk about in general, very general, general terms about the economics of, of that roadway. Uh, the city has not programmed the construction, design or construction of that roadway. Uh, it, uh, if, if it were to do so, I mean, as part of the Avonshine Park Master Plan or what have you, I, mean, I think it would be pretty costly in terms of, and the prospect of recovering uh, a good portion of that would be uh, uncertain, given the fact that it's entirely on the Avonshine Park property. Uh, I've heard a number, and correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, didn't throw a number like $800,000? Or did I make that up? That was correct. Okay. Yeah. Good. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's really a, a complex challenge, I, I would say, uh, to serve this property, which by the way, and I, I will note, uh, is shown as one of the priority single family development sites in the city's strategic plan. So I, mean, I think that staff, common council, by virtue of their review of that plan, certainly acknowledges that this is this makes sense for development for a single family subdivision. So the logistics of that are, are certainly a lot more complex, given the fact that, again, it's not directly served by any officially mapped street that they control. So, I mean, I, th I think this would serve the, the purpose of providing a roadway connection ultimately between Drexel Avenue and Forest Hill Avenue, albeit not in probably the most direct route or in the uh, design that was previously suggested for that would have been more of like a neighborhood collector street. This would be more like typical of subdivision streets and ultimately would make its way south. Although, again, the prospects for that are, are uncertain given the, the ownership structure of the lands to the south. 
Yeah. Uh, I, I think Doug spoke very well on that. Um, you also want to point out the improvements that were made in Avonshine within the last two years, probably. Um, the path that now encompasses the entire park. Um, not only that, but we also have a pretty active um, Frisbee golf course that would be impacted if we decided to move forward with that improvements on the park entrance. One of our concerns out of engineering would obviously be introducing a, an additional entrance um, onto Drexel, um, as we already have you know, pretty heavy traffic load on there, as most people can attest to. Um, so we'd have to work with developers as they came forward to make sure that you know, any improvements on Drexel or anything along those lines were addressed. Uh, Fred, anything else? I think they cover most of it. John? I'm good. Chris? Well, from a parks uh, perspective, I do have some concerns with, with Avonshine being there. I, I sit on Parks and Rec uh, a Commission, and I think that they would be a, a bit concerned about some of what's going on and what's proposed here. Um, that's my my two cents. Okay. Anything else? John? Anna, Christine? I was just going to echo, I would have the same concern as John Chris here. What do you do with the department? Well, so I guess maybe to just to paraphrase staff's position, I mean, we've worked quite a bit actually with the property owner, with the, uh, with the engineer to, uh, Take a look at different development scenarios that would provide this type of access, and I think we're we're comfortable. Certainly, we with what happens on the Utke properties themselves, just not as much with the impacts on the properties to the south. Okay, um, you know it's interesting because it is part of our comprehensive plan to develop. Um, how do the wetlands play into this, you know, west of the entrance of the park? Because there's wetlands down in the Alexander Park up there. So, I mean, that would facilitate a costly move to put any type of road. I mean, certainly wetlands, whether they be on the Yetke property or on the, the city property, will pay a, play a large part in the the eventual cost of any roadway and any crossing of those wetlands. Uh, at this point in time, you, you want to be generally aware of those, but without an actual delineation on the, the city property, I, I couldn't speak as to how that impacts the cost of the road other than to su suggest that, yeah, presence of wetlands means fill permits, means crossing permits. Uh, and again, just calls into question the desirability of having that officially mapped roadway in that location. And in the southern part, Doug, um, where they connect up to the you know, subdivision west of the bike trail there, and we eliminated that roadway. We really didn't even have to link it back up to the bike trail. That, that segment of the roadway, yes. Yeah, we. It, if it got reinstated, as, as per whatever the plan's showing here, um, who picks up the cost of that solely? The, the developer of the Utke property? Uh, because now you're going to benefit that subdivision because it looks like they get some lots out of there. Is that a shared cost? With well, it wouldn't go in unless those property owners wanted to develop that. And in. So I, I guess you know ultimately that would be their decision whether or not to develop. Uh, if that were to change, I, I'm I guess I'm suggesting that uh, that shouldn't change just because, given the fact that that roadway was eliminated less than a year and a half ago. You know, we've run into situations like. A little bit different, but Brook Preserve, where the roads kind of went in, they had a reconfigured of lots because they, they hindered on some other properties. Um, am I off base, or is this kind of somewhat a similar situation, or is it really the access that's the hugest problem here? Well, I mean, I, I, I think it's complicated in the sense that you know, this is very fresh information that we received. I'd like to uh, give the engineer an opportunity to take a look at an alternative, which does not impact that future building site on that property, given the fact that I mean, we, we know that the intent of the original 
official map submittal there was to eliminate that road to allow for a home. So, I mean, from that standpoint, um, I mean, if there's an opportunity to maintain that con connectivity without uh, impacting that future home site, that would be the win-win for the for staff and I think for the city and for the neighboring property owners. It kind of sounds like it needs more work with our staff to really iron this out. Yeah, but but I, I think it was important that we have this discussion tonight, given the, the fact that there I mean, there are a lot of intangibles on on this street pattern and and especially Abenshine being principal among them, and you know whether or not uh, I mean if would have been a game changer had the commission said, yeah, we have to have that roadway. I'm not hearing that, but uh, certainly having that clarified gives us a, a lot more confidence moving forward that we're kind of on the right track. And Matt, just to clarify them, two entrances off of Drexel, it'd be pretty unlikely that any home would walk up from that along with the entrance to Abenshine. You'd have three within. It's three within approximately 900 feet. Um, just look that up. There would probably need to be, you know, we'd really need to look at it as far as TIA, um, some improvements along Drexel, um, you know, to, to make sure that we're, we're creating a safe um, access to that. So there there is some concern. Um, there are a number of accidents along that stretch. But, you know, it's not to say that it couldn't happen. You know, there'd have to be some considerations and we'd have to work with the uh, developer okay. all right uh, I think it needs more work definitely um, what's the flavor for a motion up uh, does app oh if somebody wants to speak behind you uh, come on up oh, sir question. just name and address please Jason Strimzik, 926 East Forest Hill, and the parcel 928, which butts up the north end of their property, the Utkeys. So the money that's already been spent on the surveying to get that house that we were talking about building back there, I mean, what if you guys decide to go with this, what happens to everything that's already been put toward? I mean, or what happens if he starts building now? You know, because uh, nothing's been put in motion yet. But Well, no, nothing's been put in motion. Uh, I, I think Doug kind of said it best really getting back to, I, I just don't see it getting back to the place where it was. I just don't see it going that far, but I'm really not the expert. I, I couldn't support that either. Well, I think the a answer to your question in an indirect way is I don't think that we're prepared to move on something that shows that impact with keeping that roadway in its current location, knowing full well that, I mean, not a year and a, less than a year and a half ago, the council approved an official map amendment for that very purpose. and reliance upon that official map amendment you certainly have uh, moved forward with with plans for home on that property and I mean, if there's a way uh, to avoid that we're certainly going to make sure we take a look at that I so I, I mean, certainly the Commission can make the recommendation they want but I I don't see any support right now for the exhibit that was uh, sent to us today uh, I think that again and I don't want to put words in the Commission's mouth but I I think that uh, I'm sensing that there's some support for what happens on the Yutkey's property, but we've got to figure out a better design solution as to what happens to the properties to the south. Fair enough? I, I, I would say yes. I, I mean, that those are my feelings. I, again, just there's too many questions on the south going on. Okay. It but is. I mean... We, continuing we, to move on with his project is he allowed or is, is this uh, a hold I, I mean he can come back with our engineering department and, and our staff and, and okay. work at possible solutions but again it would come back through this process okay and you'd be right here and and hopefully depending on the distance your place is from the uh, the affected thing it's usually what 300 feet oh they'd get Take, notified you'd no, get no notified yeah. that something was going on I guess my, my question and maybe just a you know, I'll jump right to it. I mean, is, do you have, are you far enough along that you know where the house is going to be? <laughs> I don't have the map in front of me, but I think it's going to be right in the middle of that road or right next to that road. So maybe if, if we can kind of maybe work, get you in touch with our engineer to kind of plot that out so we can maybe see if there is a solution, which right. is a win-win for, yeah. for both parties. Yeah, the last thing we want to do is create more problems right. going on. So the, the clearer we can be at this point, the better off everybody is. And again, as Doug stated earlier, don't want to, for the benefit of this, 
take away the benefit of you doing it. Right. All right. Or what was your one. address again? It's 926 East Forest Hill, and the rear parcel is 928 Forest Hill, and that's the one that butts up against the Utkeys. Thanks. All right, thank you. Pam, would you like to come up? The name is Maya Yang. And, um, you can pull the mic down. Okay. I got to do it all the okay. time. <laughs> 850 East Juxo Avenue. So uh, I'm a little bit concerned because my house will be directly across from one of the roads that are being proposed. And we, uh, since drugs have become um, an, inter an interstate you know, exit, there has been a lot of accidents around the house. And so I'm just really concerned about what would be, what are the safeguard protocols that would be in place if this was to be moved forward, especially with my house being directly across, would be pointing at the road. Okay, and, um, you know, I'll, I'll let Matt kind of explain it, but he mentioned it. TIA, it's a traffic impact analysis, and I'll let Matt explain it because he is our resident expert. On yes, and I am a bit concerned because the accident has increased uh, recently, and a couple months ago there was, thank God for the tree in front of my house because if not for the tree, the car would have gone through my house. Yes, I understand. Actually, I was involved in an accident not too long ago there. So um, speaking as far as safety measures, there, there's a number of them that can be put in turn lanes, different things that could get the traffic out of the way when they're entering. Um, to give you, a, you know, exactly what's going to happen there, that's that's impossible until we actually look at how much traffic is going to be generated from a proposed um, subdivision and things along those lines. So we would look at that. We'd look at the accidents. We'd look at the volume of traffic that's actually traveling on Drexel and that what might be um, produced from this subdivision. And then we could look at different measures um, and, and their safety factors, and, and try to you know improve that intersection in that area uh, to try to to make it as safe as possible. Is it going to make it 100% safe? I I'd be lying if I told you yes, but we can make it safer, and that's about what we can promise is we can try. So my name is G. I'm I'm the husband. Um, I guess the only thing that I had was um, because of that proposed connection to this new subdivision directly impacts myself and our neighbors. And, uh, I guess we weren't really notified or give a heads up as to the direct impact of that street will have on us. And so I just felt that coming here, we finally knew what the plans were and we kind of saw that, hey, that street is going to affect ours because it's directly right in line with our house. So I just felt that that was not communicated too well to my house, to our property and 40 East Drexel. Just, just for our purposes, did you receive a notice for this meeting? We did. That's why we came. We did. Okay, good. So we didn't receive, but it was last week? Yep. Yeah. So, again, it is conceptual, and, and this is part of the planning process. Sometimes it ain't always as smooth as they go uh, because properties are complicated. This is one of them. So uh, sometimes they work through different iterations of it until they figure out what's going on and what's even developed. So I think that's important. But I would say for future, if any kind of roadway that would directly impact future houses, I would say reach out to them and just give them a heads up and say, hey, instead of a last week, we got a notice to come here. If we didn't look at the plans, we weren't even noticed that, hey, that street will affect us directly. No, but when we do our public notices, we go by city ordinance. and We go to affected properties within 300 feet, unless the alderman of the district requests we go a little farther, and we do that at times, too, um, because we do want to get the word out there. But it is pretty much standard protocol to send that notice. Yeah, I mean, it's exactly. I mean, this is uh, it's working exactly how it's supposed to work. I mean, uh, you, you knew that something was going on in, the, at the, in your neighborhood. Uh, you sent you a little bit of information. Not a lot, and unfortunately, we, we just can't send out you know a, a load of information we did provide some links as far as where to go for more information and if you have any questions we'd be happy to sit down with you and talk to you about your concerns but this uh, allows you know allowed you to be present at this meeting uh it's actually the first meeting it would be a recommendation to the common council who would be holding a public hearing at a date future uh at which you'd be getting another official notice in the in the mail uh which would be uh, probably 10 days prior to the hearing so it you know Believe it or not, it, all, it is all part of a process, and it's working the way it's supposed to. 
Okay. Um, recommendation. Um, obviously, back to the drawing board on this one for a little bit. So, um, hold it or leave it? Um, I, would, I, would, I think hold it. Okay. Put it on, put it on hold. Zikowski makes a motion that the plan commission places this item on hold for the official map at, for the portion of the northeast corner of uh, section 16 F uh, be amended after a public hearing provided there's a proposal for rely is revised and to eliminate the conflicts with existing and planned homes and adjacent properties Different seconds. Roll call. Anna, aye. Sullivan, aye. Bill, aye. Lark, aye. David, aye. Wisikowski, aye. Aldani, aye. Seifert, aye. Chandler, aye. Okay. Um, item 60 is temporary use. Uh, use permit for Tyrion Payne Tree Ripe Citrus Company for uh, temporary sale of produce uh, at 501 West Rawson Avenue. Gary? So this may be familiar to most of you on the plan commission. This is, I think, the third time that this is uh, being requested on the property of 501 West Rawson Avenue. Um, this is the proposed location. It's a little bit difficult to see, but it's proposed on the east side of the existing parking lot for Farm and Fleet. Um, however, we do have one thing that we'd like to draw to the plan commission's attention. It has nothing to do with the applicant itself, uh, themselves, but it does have to do with the property. There is already some outdoor storage that's occurring on this property that needs to be addressed. Um, it is not permitted and it needs to be removed. It would be in the proposed location of, uh, or at least in the vicinity of the proposal that is on the next agenda item. Um, but since this is on the exact same property, we wanted to draw it to the plan commission's attention. Again, nothing to do with this particular proposal, but it does affect the property. Um, so again, this is the same operation that was approved in June of 2018. Staff consistently expresses concerns for outdoor display and sale of merchandise as mentioned in the, in the staff report. We mention this every time there is a temporary use permit that is uh, for specifically outdoor storage and sale of merchandise. However, we do have a recommendation if the plan commission wishes to proceed with um, approval of this as in previous years. Um, I do want to make a little bit of um, a clarification. You may have received something in your plan commission packets that was slightly incomplete. Um, the suggested motion should the plan commission choose to approve this is that the plan commission approves the temporary use permit for outdoor produce sales from one commercial vehicle within the Farm and Fleet parking lot at 501 West Rawson Avenue on June 15th, July 13th, and August 2nd between the hours of 8 a.m. and 12 p.m. That was inadvertently left off on, I believe, the, the paper packets that were received. Um, so I just want to make that clarification for you. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Carrie. Um, would you like to say a few words? Uh, name and address, please. Uh, Tiernan Payne, 636 North 99th Street, Wauwatosa. Um, I, I think we everyone is familiar with uh, our, our, our operation, what we've done in the past. Um, for us, we feel like it does provide a, a unique service to the residents of Oak Creek and in every community that we go to. Uh, we have hundreds of customers within Oak Creek and in the area who have been purchasing from us for many, many years. Um, and really, we're looking for, it, it amounts to about four and a half hours. Uh, this is something that people would most likely purchase anyways, and it makes it convenient for them. So I think it overall is a, a net positive for everyone, for the residents, for our business. Uh, it does attract business for, for Farm and Fleet. So I, I think that it, it's the same, same thing that we've done in the past, and, and I think it does benefit everyone involved. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions for the commission? Nothing from Chaucey. Fred? Anything? I'm just not in favor of this to sell out of a truck on a parking lot. It's just the image that it gives the public. I'm not really. So you're not cool with food trucks either then? No, I didn't say I'm not against toilet <laughs> But it's just the concept of, you know, pulling in a truck for an hour or two and then pulling out. Uh, to me, it just doesn't set a good image for the city of Oak Creek. Well, maybe it's the same food truck that's making an, a stop at uh, Sun Dick's uh, to drop.
drop off the produce there. You can see if it was inside the store and you dropped it off, but yeah. just the the appearance of a truck for a couple hours just doesn't seem to sit with me. Okay, understood. Don? So, if I was when I was reading through this, do is that this has been done in the past in the Farm and Fleet parking lot, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, and I, I saw the years. I, was, I personally don't have a problem with it. Um, but I, you know, I'm very familiar with that parking lot and the way it's. Uh, you could see it from the from the street, I guess, but the way it's kind of tucked into the back over there, there's not a lot of people park over there. Right? Probably in Farm and Fleet at least once a week. Um, I guess I, I, I just don't see a big problem with it myself. It is kind of a unique thing. You know, <laughs> what Dan said, you know, it, it really is no different than a food truck, and those are popping up everywhere. So uh, I, I don't have a problem with it myself. No, yes. I've supported this in the past. The, the other issues I concur with staff on, other issues at the in the parking lot that we should maybe discuss next. Greg? Just a clarification, you're not really, you're not necessarily selling out of the truck. These are kind of online orders. You're just coming for somebody to pick the product up? No, we, we actually do make the sales at, at the point of sale. Um, we do set up uh, a little point of sale area. Uh, we've made a lot of efforts to, you know, just to speak to the comment about the image, to make it a, a nice, uh, visually appealing uh, point of sale. Uh, we've been sought out by many municipalities, farmers markets. Uh, we're attending the Northwestern Mutual Farmers Market at fr the Franklin campus as well as downtown this year. So it's something that's well known, but it is available for people to purchase uh, without previously ordering online. And you're, you market for just those specific days you show up and people come. Exactly. Yeah. Ron? Matt? Christina? Um, I myself, I've proved it in the past. Again, uh, I'd like to see you know, all those three dates be incorporated somewhere into our farmer's market in the future. I think that would be a great compromise, and it would be an added incentive for people to come to the farmer's market. Um, but again, that's something to work out with uh, our farmer's market and things going forward. But otherwise, I'm that's okay with it. a good idea. It's a good idea. Um, we'd be in favor of that, too. So. Yeah. So anyways, um, no other discussion. Motion, please. Oracle move that the plan commission approve the temporary use permit for outdoor produce dis produce sales from one commercial vehicle on the parking lot of. Would you like some assistance please. with that? <laughs> <laughs> that the plan commission approves the temporary use permit for outdoor produce sales from one commercial vehicle within the Farm and Fleet parking lot at 501 West Rawson Avenue on June 15th, July 13th, and August 2nd between the hours of 8 a.m. and 12 p.m. Is it Gauss Gill second? That's my motion. All right. Roll call. Anna, aye. Sullivan, aye. Aye. Bark, aye. Avich, aye. Is it Gauss Gill, aye. Donnie, aye. Seaford, no. Chandler, aye. Okay. Um, item E is another temporary use permit of for Farm and Fleet for temporary outdoor display that was mentioned prior at the property at 501 West Rawson Avenue. Uh, once again, Carrie. So the proposal is for the outdoor display of trailers, but this is on the opposite side of the parking lot, so it would be along uh, 6th Street as highlighted in yellow on the screen. It's a little bit difficult to see, so I'm going to zoom in a bit. Um, this is also the area of concern or around the area of concern that was previously stated with the outdoor storage um, that is unpermitted and would need to be removed. Uh, the display would be uh, for 12 trailers. Um, the plan commission granted a temporary use permit for a similar operation in 2010, 2013, 2016, and 2017, but for eight trailers, uh, plan commission approved an increase to 12 last year. Uh, staff has been unaware of any complaints. Um, however, we have mentioned that outdoor storage area. Uh, we consistently express concerns with the outdoor display of merchandise, as previously mentioned, and we have presented some options for consideration 
to the Planning Commission, and there is a suggested motion within that staff report should the Planning Commission wish to approve this. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Carrie. Um, we've gotten some information on this. I think most of you are very well aware of this, but uh, we kind of go through this every spring. So, open it up for questions. Let's start with Christina. Anything? No, I'm just kind of confused with the suggested motion in the report here. In the top, it says the staff does not support, and then there is a motion to support. So, I'm kind of confused. Staff does not support it for the reasons stated. However, if the plan commission wishes to okay. propose uh, an approval, that motion is stated below staff statement. Okay. No, I have no comment so far. Yeah. On. On. Greg. What's currently out there? Are the trailers already out there? Uh, no, currently not. And what it can be a condition of the motion to be removed? unauthorized or is that something completely separate? Land Commission can condition the removal of the existing unpermitted outdoor storage. Okay, Craig. Thank you, Chris. Wait, what else is there that that's not allowed? Is, or if we just add that condition in there, that'll take clean up some of the issues? So the outdoor storage that would be permitted would just be limited to the trailers. There would be no outdoor storage other than the trailers as specified uh, for, the, for the designated time period in the designated location. Okay, but they can have outdoor storage, like, because I think there's outdoor storage on... That is uh, not permitted. On the east uh, side of the building? Yeah, I mean, if you... If you if you pull up the aerial, you'll see within the yard, and I think it's within the fenced area, they, they do have outdoor storage. But I think what we're referring to is the area between their building and South 6th Street. Yeah, okay. That's that's where I was going. Is yeah. So they could still do the work that they need to do outside. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'd be in favor of that then. My apologies for the misunderstanding. Yes, it would be for the, uh, I believe it's mulch and related areas that are outside. But yes, within the designated yard, that would still be allowed. Thank you. And Don? I have no questions. Fred? No. Jossie? No. Okay. Um, no, I don't have any comment, but I would, would appreciate it if you guys clean that up because it's not allowed and um, we're in between zoning, guys. Otherwise, we get sick to my ears. <laughs> <laughs> um, otherwise, motion. Would there be a number five? For the non permitted, or does that just leave that a, out? Yeah, you could add a five if that's a condition, correct? I will work on some wording. If you'd like to start, start. I think she'll be pretty quick about it. <laughs> Laura moves that the plan commission approve the temporary use permit for outdoor display of trailers within the parking lot at 501 West Rawson Avenue with the following conditions. Number one, that a maximum of 12 trailers are on display at any time. Number two, that all trailers for sale are located within the west parking lot in designated stalls along 6th Street, as identified in the submitted site plan. Number three, that no additional signage is allowed for the temporary display of trailers. Number four, that the temporary use permit shall expire on October 1st, 2019. Number five. That all unpermitted outdoor storage and display of merchandise is removed, and I'm saying prior to locating trailers outside. And okay. condition number five, as stated. Is it call skills second? Before we vote, Jeremy, do you have anything you want to no, You say? said no more signage. We have to put signage out there to uh, price our trailers. Does that? Jeremy, can we get your name? Yes, please? Jeremy Heiners. <clears throat> Excuse me. Jeremy Heiners, 501 West Rossum. Um, we'll work with the applicant on, on the signage issue. It would be like a stick sign. I don't remember what it counts for. That would be for each trailer. As, as long as it complies with code requirements, we're okay with it, but we didn't want multiple signs. We didn't want, you know, flags and banners sure. and yeah. wacky waving inflatable arm flailing tube men yeah. out there. Just that kind of thing. Check with staff and work. Work through that. So, um, we're voting, right? Uh, roll call. 
And an eye. Sullivan eye. Yellow eye. Auric eye. Kavich eye. Zikowski eye. Aldani eye. Secret eye. Chandler eye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, item F is to review site, lighting, and landscaping plans for the Sikh Temple uh, for an expansion to their existing parking lot and stormwater infrastructure modifications on the property at 7502 and 7512 South Howell. Carrie? So the proposal is to add um, a parking area to the addition to the existing parking area on the property. While the location map shows this as a few different properties, it's actually been reconfigured uh, by CSM. What we are looking at right now is a proposed parking area on the lot that was along Howell Avenue and acquired by the Sikh Temple, uh, included in a CSM that was approved, I believe, last year. The plan calls for the addition of 115 stalls in that location. This is in addition to the existing 153 stall parking lot on the property. As mentioned in the staff report, there is a preliminary landscaping plan that has been in included. However, additional landscaping considerations, as mentioned in the staff report, um, may require the reconfiguration or the revision of the plans themselves. If the plan commission is uh, comfortable with the condition that the director approved the landscaping plan prior to the submission of permits, that is included in the motion. Another consideration is lighting in this area. We have received um, some concerns that have been raised by neighbors in the area for the existing lighting in the parking lot. With the additional parking stalls, there has been a photometric plan submitted. However, the photometric plans are not actually um, inclusive of the lighting uh, levels that are at the property line as required by code, so that will need to be amended. We would also like to uh, suggest that full cutoff fixtures be in included or at least considered to reduce the lighting that would be affecting the neighboring properties. Trees in the vicinity, in the vicinity of the proposed stormwater um, pond should be preserved or at least uh, to the extent practicable for uh, buffering purposes to those neighboring properties as well. Um, there may be a requirement for additional landscaping if those trees just cannot be preserved. Uh, due to the configuration and the requirements for that stormwater infrastructure. Again, that would be included in the landscaping plan that would be approved by the director. There is one area that has been identified in the plans for a flat recreational play area. However, we don't have additional details for that. Um, we don't also have lighting for that, so we are assuming that that would be unlit at this time. These are the fixtures that have been proposed. Um, if in the future additional lighting would be needed for the, that play area, we would be uh, working with the applicant to ensure that the fixtures are cut off fixtures or if there are additional reviews that are necessary, we would work with the applicant on that. If the plan commission is satisfied with the proposal, there is a suggested motion that the plan commission approves the site plan submitted by the Sick Temple of Wisconsin for the property at 7512 South Howell Avenue subject to conditions one through four. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, we'll open it up to the commission for questions. Nothing from Christina. Don. Greg. What you, Chris? Oh, looks good. Donnie? No questions. I have a question to Matt about stormwater runoff of this parking lot. Do we have a problem with that at all? Um, looking at it with our environmental engineer, it's being handled in a swale that runs to the west or to the east, east to the new pond. So um, it's currently existing parking lot is handled the same way. Um, so no, we don't have any concerns at this point. Um, I guess the the main comment from our environmental engineer was um, a, more of a question of why the existing pond wasn't uh, expanded and, and utilized. That would be it. Thank you. Rossi? I do have a question for the applicant. Can somebody please come up? Name and address, sir. I'm Dr. Dali Wal, uh, Chair of the Board of Trustees. Any question? What was the question? 
my first question, can you provide a little more information about the recreational play area? We really haven't got any plans uh, detailed. There's only one uh, outside the children's playground that's open. But in future, we might be building something, and we already have a provision in the, uh, um, the pond we made, so we can make another structure of, of say, maybe to, I will, about 12,000 square feet area. It's already provision there, but there's no provision at this time. We haven't planned anything, but we're thinking of building something, um, either a, a shared kind of a thing that can be converted into uh, a, or parties and so on, or maybe an actual building. And there's a possibility that could be an indoor uh, uh, playground for the kids or sports like bas multi-purpose building. So we really have these ideas, but it hasn't been crystallized as to what we really need. So we'll have, once this project is done, we'll have a discussion about the next one, and we'll be able to give you more specific information. So Kerry, is that sufficient? Yeah, it's just okay. a placeholder at this time. Place Any holder. future development, we would always, you know, have a, an opportunity to review and help the applicant with. Okay. And then my next question is about the lighting concerns. So do you have any feedback about those concerns and how to potentially address those concerns? As far as I know, the electrician did talk to the people here, and uh, he has the details as the... The, how strong the lighting uh, fixture should be and so on. So to my knowledge, he has looked into that. The light would be according to what the city requires. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. Um, yeah, I would agree. You know, they, there's some questions on the landscaping, but everything has to be worked out prior to um, building permits going out. So we got to get everything square there. Same with the lighting goes. Um, the only question I have, and I brought this up, I visited Temple about two weeks ago, talked to them. Coming off Howell Avenue, they have an existing entrance. And they, they acquired the home and, and the other entrances there. I asked them to maybe consider a one-way in and a one-way out. Um, I, I don't know how that works with the state or if that's something possible to help service that and get the flow of the traffic. Is that something they control, or is that something you can suggest? Certainly, Howell Avenue State Highway 38 is under the jurisdiction of the state. I mean, my my, my thought would be that they, if they were, had a chance to eliminate one driveway, they would. They'd probably restrict it to one, but that is their call and their their car okay. call only. Okay. Thanks, Doug. Uh, other than that, no, I I don't have any issues with it. Uh, I would suggest greatly, though, with the lighting, uh, with the new LED products coming out, they're very bright. Work with our electrical inspector and make sure they're cut off. Uh, and be respectful of the neighbors. You know, we have had to go back on businesses lately and have to adjust those later on because they are intrusive to others. So other than that, I'm good. All right, motion. Keeper moves that the Planning Commission approve the site plan submitted by the Seek Temple of Wisconsin for the property at 7512 South Howell Avenue with the following conditions. One, that all relevant code requirements remain in effect. Two, that a detailed landscaping plan is submitted for review and approval by the Director of Community Development prior to submission of permit applications. Three, that a detailed lighting plan is submitted for review and approved by the electrical inspector prior to submission of permit applications. Four, that all revised plans, site, building, landscaping, east elevation, and so forth are submitted in digital format for review and approval by the Development of Community Development prior to the submission of permit applications. Chandler seconds. Roll call. Anna, aye. Sullivan, I. Hello, I. Lorik, I. Kavich, I. Wizikowski, I. Aldani, I. Super, I. Chandler, I. Okay. Good luck, gentlemen. Um, item 6G is a plan review for site building and landscape lighting and related plans uh, for an addition to the existing car wash on the property at 100 West Rawson. Gary. 
The proposal is to add a pay pavilion to the addition of the existing car wash, which is located in red on the screen, and located in red on the site plan. So for those of you who are not familiar, this is on the corner of Howell and Rawson. And this is a close-up of where the proposed paved pavilion would be located. There is already a pay station there. This is going to be adding a little bit more of a robust building. Uh, it's 130 square feet. It's a freestanding pay pavilion. It does meet setbacks, and it is outside of that AT ATC easement. There are no other changes to the um, the site or the existing building. However, they are proposing some updates to the landscaping around the building, so we will need an updated landscape plan. Signs are not included in this review. However, anything that is proposed would have to meet code requirements. And this is a rendering of the proposed pay pavilion. The materials are intended to match the building. However, there is a, a comment that staff provided to the applicant's consultants that the structure should be constructed with CMU and standard brick and not the proposed cementitious panels because they should match the building exactly as, as closely as possible. So if the plan commission is satisfied with the proposal, there is a suggested motion that the plan commission approves the site plans submitted by Milo Thomas of MRT Investments LLC for the property at 100, 100 West Rawson Avenue, that's hard to say, subject to conditions one for, through four. And there is just one typo that is in Condition number four, there is no east elevation requirement, so you can just strike that. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Carrie. Gentlemen, would you like to say a few words before we open it up for questions? No, I just want to let, uh, introduce myself, Milo Thomas, the owner of Oak Creek Car Wash and MRT Investments. And if you had any questions, I'm here for you, as well as my partner back there. Okay. Um, we'll start it out with questions from the commission. Let's go first, Jossie. Can you give a little more information what is a pay pavilion? Is it replacing the pay structure that's already there? Yes, so we, uh, it, it, it's actually incorporating. So currently, the, uh, my car wash manager uh, sits in the back of the building uh, where we have a little sitting space for him, and we thought it would be a good idea to move him to the front. So we wanted to get him out of the building, more available to customers when they see someone's there and the tenant is there. And so we've moved it there. We'll take down the current point of sales and incorporate them into the pay On the, I should say, that's on the east side. Is the one that's back there. So does that replace the pay station? Yes. That okay, so that'll them. go away. Yeah, we will be incorporating that pay station. So we will be able to still take, if no one's attending, you can still use the car wash if no one's there. So we'll do that point of sale system there. Does that make sense to you? Yes. <laughs> Yet, I I didn't see that on here. Maybe I missed it. it Where you're well, at? it won't be in the building. It won't be on the building. It'll be freestanding next to it. Next to oh okay. okay. Does that Dan? Is, yeah. Yes. So this little okay. square right here. Look at yeah. Mm -hmm. so the site plan. There might be a little rectangle yeah, there. I mean, I can't. Thank you. Okay, Brad, anything from you? Oh, um, Donnie? There, there, there's going to be a pay station on each side, just like there is now, right? Yeah, like there is now. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Sorry for the confusion. Chris, good to me. Awesome. Um, that's my only concern is how do you guys feel about matching the existing building because it's a premier corner and we're not going to take anything less than an exact replacement. It does. <laughs> <laughs> One thing, so we have. Sir, we need you to put on your oh, address sorry. on that. Uh, my name is Dan Beyer, uh, and my address is uh, 225 East St. Paul in Milwaukee. Uh, we actually just got some uh, brick, our brick samples out there. One of our concerns was we know if you go to the existing uh, building, we know the split face, split face block on the base of the building we can match that uh, we actually have a really good match of that um, and so we're not concerned on that the kind of the 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 dusty rose uh pinkish brick uh, above the base is uh is kind of the ones that we're a little more concerned about 
we, we uh, know that those were manufactured by a company, Bend Industries, that is no longer around, so we know we're not going to get an exact match. The good news is that we this pavilion is not never is separated from the building, so the, the two bricks are never uh, up against each other. But we did bring out, and I got some photos, I don't know if I can pass these around, sure. that show. Have to stay in the mic. Sorry, but it does show that the best match of the brick is this down here, and that's you know it's 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 okay. It's not great. So that's that's our biggest concern about matching uh, the materials, and that's why we kind of some agree went with a cementitious panel because is that a four inch brick? This is a this is a I think we would match. I think it's a jumbo brick on the. Building. It's actually concrete brick. It's not a clay brick. Um, so we, but we would match the size if we went with this of what's on the building. Okay. Yeah, that building building's got to be getting on twenty years old. So. Fifteen. Fifteen. Yeah. yeah. Fifteen. Yeah, staff isn't looking for an exact match, but just something close. So are we. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Don. So, so right now there's a light pole right there between the two pay stations, right? Where is there going to be lighting replacing that uh, on the building, or does there need to be? That light pole's there for a reason, obviously. Yeah, I, we would probably um, replace it and either mount it on the building or uh, put a new one on the building. We don't have to even address that. You're a 24-7 operation, right? Uh, we are not a 24-7. We are uh, closed at 10 we close at uh, 10 p.m. and open at 5 a.m. Because I would think that that's providing the light for the driveways. Absolutely. And right. so that's a really good question, but Don. You also have 24-hour service that you can do it yourself, right? Uh, we, I do not. I do not. But, uh, it, it, that's but I know exactly what you yeah. yeah. In, in the winter, you know, when, when it starts, fall comes, people are still washing their cars. It's uh, dark early. Absolutely. And lighting is essential there and for for many reasons to let people know we're open, <laughs> to let you know people feel safe. So absolutely lighting, lighting will be there. So staff would just recommend that you work closely with the electrical inspector to address his concerns. Absolutely. You could put that in form in the form of like landscape elevation. Okay. Um, any other questions? Good. Uh, seeing none, motion. Clark moves that the plan commission approves the site plans submitted by Milo Thomas MRT Investments LLC for the property at 100 West Rawson Avenue with the following conditions. Number one, that all relevant code requirements remain in effect. Number two, that a detailed landscape plan is submitted for review and approval by the director of community development prior to submission of permit applications. Number three, that the pay pavilion is constructed with CMU and brick, minimum four inch dimension as required by code to match the existing building. Number four, that all revised plans, site building, landscaping, east elevation, etc. are submitted in digital format for review and approval by the Department of Community Development prior to the submission of permit applications. One quick question. Do we include the lighting? The lighting? Uh, I was just going to say. Is that included in the Excedra? <laughs> That's fine. Okay. Let's make note of that, guys. Um, Chandler, second. Okay. Uh, roll call. Anna, aye. Sullivan, aye. Bill, aye. Lorak, aye. David, aye. Isikowski, aye. Donnie, aye. Super, aye. Chandler, aye. Okay. Luck, guys. When do you plan to start, by the way? Uh, still to be determined, right? We won. Okay. Uh, we want to get it done uh, before fall. Okay. 
Good luck. Nice morning. Item 6H is an affidavit of, uh, affidavit of correction uh, by Erica Nicole Harris Wispark for the property at 280 South Oak. And commissioners may recall that this property was subject of a CSM in recent months and part of that CSM discussion included a tree preservation discussion um, as it affected the PUD. Staff worked with the applicant and came up with some language that was included on the CSM prior to recording. However, there was a concern that was raised uh, regarding the language itself. Um, it was a little bit more restrictive than what's allowed by code and include undisturbed in a buffer area. Um, that wasn't caught prior to the recording, so after conversations with the applicant and trying to get uh, an idea of what the, um, what the future potential development of the property would be, uh, both staff and the applicant decided that uh, it would be uh, more agreeable to address that tree preservation or buffer area um, at the site plan level rather than saying it's an unrestricted or a restricted buffer on the CSM. So the proposal is simply to remove that restriction on the CSM that was approved and because of the uh, agreement that it would be worked at at the, sta at the site plan level, uh, staff is in support of this removal. So there is a suggested motion that the plan commission recommends that the Common Council approves the affidavit of correction submitted by Erica Nicole Harris of Wisp Park LLC removing a reference to an undisturbed 20-foot buffer on lot one of CSM 9131 located at 280 West Oakview Parkway. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Carrie. Questions? Kind of recall that or those Oops. that are new. Further explanation? Mr. Zikowski makes a motion that the plan commission recommends to the Common Council approve the affidavit of correction submitted by Erica Nicole Harris, Wisp Park LLC, removing the reference to an undisturbed 20-foot buffer on lot one of CFSM 9131, located at 280 West Oakview Parkway. Stanford seconds. Roll call. Anna, aye. Sullivan, aye. 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 Laura, aye. Kavich, aye. Kuzikowski, aye. Aldani, aye. Super I. Chandler I. Item 6I is a signed plan review for Stan Optical for the space at 120 West Town Square. The proposal is for wall signs for the tenant. It's on the third building, the most southernmost building, and the southernmost portion of that building. It's a little bit difficult to read, but this is the site plan showing the existing buildings. Again, and the proposed signs are actually on three sides, uh, the east, west, and south, as depicted on this site plan. So A, A, and B. As plan commissioners are aware, all signs within Drexel Town Square require plan commission approval. The allowed signs in this area are one primary sign per entry facade per tenant, one eye level sign or graphic per 12 linear feet of entry facade with a maximum 10% coverage, and one primary sign on Howell Avenue as that is a special condition facade. Per the master sign plan that was approved by the plan commission, wall signs cannot exceed 36 inches in height, and they are limited to one square foot per one linear foot of tenant frontage. So this is a proposal for the east side of the building. This is facing Howell Avenue. This is what would be shown on the south elevation. However, the south elevation no longer has an entry that would be accessed by the public. That door has been removed. Therefore, the south sign as proposed is not allowed. And this is the west elevation showing uh, an entry facade, and this sign is meeting the requirements of both the Drexel Town Square PUD as well as the master sign plan. And these are the channel letters that are proposed on all sides. There is 
There are two areas that are uh, addressed in the staff report that uh, staff would like to draw the Plan Commission's attention to. Drexel Town Square requires a specific percentage of clear glazing on the buildings, especially along the commercial spaces that are on public rights of way. As you know, buildings have been designed to conform to these requirements, and all of them have been approved by the Plan Commission with specific glazing, clear glazing. Staff has been uh, made aware that the tenant space in this particular location has been either covered or there have been walls constructed up to those windows. This gives the impression of opaque windows, which is not allowed. There's also a banner style sign within the interior that is facing outward on the south elevation. It has been set back two feet from the glass as we've been told. However, this also gives the impression that the windows are entirely covered by a sign. You can't see the interior of the space. These types of treatments are not mentioned in the Drexel Town Square General Development Plan or Regulating Plan as allowed, nor do they meet the spirit, intent, goals of the design requirements for clear glazing, pedestrian friendly, and community oriented buildings for the, PU for the PUD. It's staff's opinion that the window coverings and walls need to be removed as they are not included in any architectural reviews or approvals by the Plan Commission. And since the effect of the banner is to seemingly circumvent these sign regulations, staff is also of the impression that they need to be removed as a violation of the plan. However, it is up to the Plan Commission to make that final determination. There is a suggested motion that the Plan Commission approves the sign plans submitted by Stanton Optical for the property 120 West Town Square Way, subject to conditions one through four. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, we'll open it up for the commission. Thank you, Matt. Greg. The door that was removed, it's not going back in ever, is it? The door has not been removed. The right. door is still existing. On the south side? Yes. Is that it's be just that it's, it's not operable right now, but the door is still there. I'm right sorry, now, with this tenant, or ever? With this tenant. It will never be used with this no, tenant. No, I, that's the, uh, if the commission it, concerns about the interior signage has to be removed, because right now the banners sit two foot inside the glass. So if the commission wants that removed, then the owner will go ahead and make the the door operable. There is a landing. Everything is is you know to code there. I'm sorry if you would please just give your name and address for the recording. Oh. Uh, Gary Strom, N five one five Blackhawk Bluff Drive, Milton. So if that's all removed and that door is used, is that sign then allowed? Is that correct? The south side. If it was an entry facade that was uh, included an entry that was accessible to the public, then it would be allowed. Okay. And there is sidewalk leading there with railing and everything. The original plan for the building did have an entry that would be accessible to the public on this location, on this elevation, um, but these plans don't reflect that. So that was why the comment was made in the staff report. If we do get a plan, and if that door is operable and made available to the public, then the sign would could come back. Thank you. I have a quick question ahead, on, on the same topic. So can you help me understand why the door is not operable? Is it because the sign was put there? Because the, um, the banners inside more or less deleted the, the door access. Okay, so what is the, the purpose of the banner? That's their their uh, image inside. Um, I I imagine it's it's a way to skirt the, the permitting. Yep. Okay. I guess uh, as it's been explained to me in, in speaking with someone from Stanton Optical, this is their prototype sign package. And you know, I explained to him the uniqueness of the product that 
be had by Drexel Town Square and the fact that by virtue of their deciding to locate it in this unique development, that they would be held to the, the spirit of that sign ordinance uh, and suggested that those signs be eliminated. And you, you're right. You know, although they are set back two feet, they are not technically window signs, but clearly it is with the intent of drawing. It's for no other purpose than to draw attention from the outside of the of the store and, in fact, is creating a barrier between uh, the windows and the, uh, the the interior of the store. And so I, I, I hopefully, and it sounds like they've been uh, taking that to heart and will be changing that. I think if, if that is the case, that's great. Uh, I think that the only issue we have, and not necessarily with the signs, that it's now what the, the tenant is with respect to the, the lack of clear glazing on the east elevation. And if, and if I could address that, um, the approved plans upon the build out had that uh, there's two um, rooms there for exams. So when you're looking from, from Howell in, you're seeing a white drywalled wall. So um, and that was approved upon permitting of the um, build out. That was not approved by this plan commission. Okay. Um, it, they have, I, I guess, a couple options. Um, if the, the commission would permit them painting that wall black. So when you look from Howell in, it looks clear glass. Right now, it looks like there's something on the windows, which the windows are clear. It's just the, the backing of the drywall that makes it look like it's, it's blocked out white. If you painted it black, you know, you'd see clear glass. It wouldn't stick out. Yeah, I guess I wouldn't be prepared to accept that solution this evening uh, without seeing that in, in design. Uh, is the entire east elevation covered by the exam rooms? You would ask that your architects come up with a better design solution than painting that black. I have a question. What's the purpose to the wall? Why Why is it there? It I, just, I guess I missed that. It just, uh, there's two exam rooms there. It just, you know, what, uh, the only alternative would be a, a darkening drape, you know, keeping those exam rooms, uh, you know, private. So if I may, the Plant Commission may recall that we had a similar uh, discussion whenever the Delta Dent, or I'm sorry, the uh, Forward Dental uh, proposal came forward. And what was suggested to Forward Dental at that time, because they were proposing their chairs facing the windows, was for them to install blinds. Um, the effect is that we have clear glazing as required by the, the, the PUD. Um, it allows for the required privacy for HIPAA and for the patient's comfort. Um, it also allows them to raise and lower the shade as necessary for interior light. So if they're not in business, you know, if it's beyond business hours or if they just don't have a, a chair that's being used, they do have the option of raising that shade and allowing the light in. Um, similar to the other tenants in this three-building multi-tenant proposal, we have suggested as staff that for privacy purposes, they install shades on the east elevation rather than blocking or uh, installing a film or anything like that over the, the windows. Anytime those windows are blocked or anytime those windows are proposed to have any kind of change other than a sign that meets the sign code, uh, we've required them to go for uh, architectural review before the plan commission.
And I could, I will suggest to the owner, tell him the wall's got to come down and they got to put some blinds up. Yeah, it, if I understand correctly, instead of putting blinds up like dental or like the hospital did across the street and put their chair and, you know, in that area, they they built an interior exam room. So all you see from Howell Avenue is this wall. White. You see so it white. It doesn't do them any good. It looks bad on our part as well. Okay, just making sure. So what we're thinking is that they get rid of that interior and put lines so that they could put the chairs right up to that. If I may, I, I think that we're... You know, we, we certainly uh, acknowledge the need for permanent signage at the location. I did, and if, if you know, speaking on my behalf and hopefully staffs, I, we think that the signage, again, subject to the, the conditions and the discussion we had, that permanent signage is fine. And I think we'd like to get that up as soon as possible so that we don't have, right now there's temporary signage up there, which I don't think does anyone any good. Uh, just but We just do need to acknowledge that. I mean, there will be some action that's necessary on the part of the tenant to comply with the approved architectural plan and we would expect that sooner rather than later uh and so i mean we have no interest in holding up the the issuance of the the, the permanent signage for this space but i think that you know, everyone's aware of the issues with respect to the architecture and and they need to be taken care of would i have to come back then for another conditional use for that southern sign so what staff would propose if the plan commission is satisfied with that sign and all three signs are the exact same size instead of saying that the sign on the south elevation is not approved if you would like to condition it upon that that door being operable and open to the public for customer use you can approve that sign with that condition okay um where do we leave off have a comment? No, I'm good. Don? I'm good. Fred? Good. Ross, anything else? Um, I, yeah, I don't have a problem with the two signs. As far as the south side of the sign, um, I think the next town that we have to have a five foot three foot sign. And I don't think your comments are being picked up on the oh, mic. I'm sorry. Um, I'll just repeat from the start that the the east and west sign don't have a problem with as far as the south side sign goes you know we're debating this door and if they're ever going to use it and what have you did we allow it for max i don't recall off the top of my head whether we included um, a provision for a sign on the north elevation for max or on the south elevation certainly the east and west elevations were approved mm -hmm. um, the north elevation for verizon was approved okay so they were do they have an entrance door on that one? I don't believe they do. No. Okay. Um, but I, I believe they were approved as part of a, of a, a either the master sign program or another review by this commission. Okay. Uh, because these were just spec buildings, nobody knew who was going to occupy what end. So the ends got doors on the south in case they were patio restaurant or correct or they had the use for it. Uh, my suggestion is first of all. Clean up the banners and all all the stuff that goes around it, and quit playing games with that. Because clearly, in the Drexel uh, sign criteria of Town Square, the eye level signage clearly states it's not allowed. It's got to go. You want to come back for that southern sign, get that door working, accessible to the public, as Carrie said, and bring it back again, and we'll reconsider. I guess that's my two cents on the whole the whole thing. Um, the, enti the entire space they're occupying is is covered by the wall. The two exam rooms are that big. Really? Wow. Okay. I, I they got I, all their eye equipment in there. Okay. I guess I got to take another look at it. Uh, haven't haven't really noticed. But anyways, it's my two cents. So I'm kind of with Doug. We're not going to hold up the, the east and west, or at least my opinion. We won't. But if you want that third one, but clearly. They got to clear out that banner. We didn't allow it in the first place. Get to the shades. Do what you got to do. Um, but again, we're not going to bend the rules for one. You know, we didn't do it for the other. Can uh, Mayor? Can we go ahead and add 
it, that is part of the condition for south elevation for number three instead of not adding so that way they can keep going on all three signs and add in the door i i would i would say no what's your opinion i, I mean who's to say they're going to make that door operable well if it's a condition of approval that the sign is only approved or only allowed if that door is made operable and open to the public we can make that a condition okay i um See anybody using it because everybody parks on, on one side of the building. But you might have people that gotta get their steps in and go around. I don't know. <laughs> well, if you if you don't feel it should go on no. your right, mom, okay with no, that. No, guys, it's up to you, Chris. Go right ahead. The commission will make that call. So Greg Greg says he'd throw it in too. So or so there's a couple of typos that are in the suggested motion. It should be sign plans, not site plans. And it's submitted by Stanton Optical that uh, the applicant was a holdover from a previous um, staff report. So if, if I'm hearing the plan commission correctly, you would like to amend condition number three to allow for that south elevation sign upon uh, that door being operable. I will condition, I will fashion some language for you. My suggested motion would be for condition number three that the door on the south elevation shall be made operable and open to the public prior to the installation of a 41.91 square foot sign. Okay. Ready. To attempt the motion. Oracle move that the plan commission approve the sign plans submitted by Stanton Optical for the property at 120 West Town Square Way with the following conditions. Number one, that all relevant code requirements remain in effect. Number two, that the 41.91 square foot wall sign on the west elevation entry facade and 41.91 square foot wall sign on the east elevation special condition facade are approved. Number three, that the southern door shall be opened for customer use prior to the installation of a 41.91 square foot sign on the south elevation. Would you like to also add that if the door is not made operable, no sign is allowed on the south elevation? Yes, add that as stated. And then number four, that all revised plans, site building, landscaping, east elevation, etc., are submitted in digital format for review and approval by the Department of Community Development prior to the submission of permit ap applications. Mr. Kelsey, yes. we'll hey, hang on. What about the, the banner displays that are going on within the windows? Do they have to be removed? If it's they are not sign? allowed as part of this review. They are not allowed as part of the PUD. They are considered in violation and would have to be removed as such. That they have to be removed if they're inside the relation goes in. 
So condition number five, that the banner on the inside of the window on the south elevation shall be removed prior to the submission of permit applications. Fifth condition. All elevations. So it's on all elevations as stated. So the temporary banner on all elevations shall be removed prior to the submission of permit applications. Quick what? question. So does that include this wall? The banner. Banners. We will discuss the wall as part of an architectural feature. Oh, okay. Later. Okay. Thank you. I'll amend to add condition five as stated. Second. Roll call. Anna, aye. Sullivan, aye. Hello, aye. Lorik, aye. Kavich, aye. Zani, aye. Shepard, aye. Chandler, aye. All right. Good luck. Thank you. Um, before we wrap up, just a couple of quick announcements. Tomorrow night is our preview of Oak Creek on Discover Wisconsin. Uh, when's that kicking off? Five o'clock at Community Center? Six? Six o'clock at the Community Center. The public is welcome. Uh, it's quite a milestone for us that we're making uh, state TV and we're a featured city on there. Not everybody gets to that level, so please come on out. Uh, also, uh, farmer's market opens up this weekend. Dawn, you want to give a plug to that? Yep, this Saturday will be the first of 20 weeks in a row. And we'll have the farmer's market. Uh, starts at 9 o'clock, runs till 1 p.m. Excellent. Lots to do. Get out, okay. discover, and celebrate Oak Creek. I'd like to thank our staff, uh, planning, engineering, and our IT guy back there, Tim. He always gets the job done. Uh, appreciate uh, all your professionalism getting us through this. So. Uh, as always, you're well prepared. So with that, adjournment. Brillo moves to adjourn at 7.45. Secret seconds. Roll call. Anna, aye. Sullivan, aye. Carillo, aye. Clark, aye. Kavich, aye. Wysikowski, aye. Aldani, aye. Secret, aye. Chandler, aye. All right, good night. Hope to see you all tomorrow.